This presentation is on Basel 3, which contains the new set of banking regulations prescribed by the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. I am Pat Obi, Professor of Finance at the Calumet campus of Purdue University. And so it was on September 12, 2010, that the Basel Committee came out and announced what they refer to as a substantial strengthening of existing capital requirements. And as you might imagine, this was developed in response to observed deficiencies in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis with respect to banking regulation. Now, the new standards address in particular capital adequacy for banks and the liquidity position of uh, banks. The emphasis, though, is on capital adequacy, which, again, deals with the minimum capital that banks should have in place for the kind of risks that they take. So in Basel 3, the total regulatory capital ratio should not only include Tier 1 capital ratio, which was already addressed in Basel 2, but additionally what in Basel 3 they refer to as capital conservation buffer, counter-cyclical capital buffer, and capital for systemically important banks. These are explained in turns. But first though, remember that under Basel II, the total capital that a bank must have is equal to 8% of credit risk-weighted assets, market risk-weighted assets, and operational risk-weighted assets. So that suppose that the sum of these risk-weighted assets is, for example, $10,000, and these could be in millions. 8% of that is 800 bucks. So that means that this bank's total capital should not fall below $800. Under Basel II, Tier 1 capital ratio should be no less than 4% of risk-weighted assets. In other words, one half of this 8% should come from Tier 1 capital. Tier 1 capital sources include common equity and non-redeemable and non-cumulative preferred stock. Now, of this, core Tier 1 capital under Basel II should be no less than 2%. Core Tier 1 capital is only common equity, which comprises common stock investments by those who truly own the banking business in addition to any retained earnings that have accumulated over the years. In Basel III now, Tier 1 capital ratio has been kicked up from 4% to 6% of risk-weighted assets. And of which core Tier 1 capital ratio has now been bumped up quite a bit from 2% to 4.5%. Now continuing to the second standard which calls for mandatory capital conservation buffer, there was none on the Basel II. Under Basel III, it stipulates that banks should hold additional capital conservation buffer of 2.5% in core Tier 1 equity in order to withstand future periods of uh, financial stress. So what this does is to bring total common equity capital, which is core Tier 1 equity capital ratio, from, if I may go back here, 4.5% in the first standard to 7% now, which is 4.5% plus this additional 2.5%. In the third standard, it prescribes discretionary counter-cyclical capital buffer. Under Basel II, there was none. Under Basel III, it says that in addition to the 4.5% core Tier 1 capital ratio specified in the first standard and the 2.5% buffer specified in the second standard, that banks should also hold a counter-cyclical capital buffer of up to 2.5% of core Tier 1 capital during periods of high credit growth. Now, it must be noted that this provision is in response to studies that show that most major banking crises occurred in periods of high credit growth, and that at such times when generally we often see low interest rates that make it cheap for people to borrow and liberal lending terms that make it easy for anybody who wants to take out funds to borrow 
you know, as occurred in 2000, uh, in the period uh, leading up to the 2007 um, housing market collapse, they find that loan delinquency rates tend to rise with the volume of uh, loans that have been made. And so to ensure that banks are prepared for a crisis that could occur in the months to follow, they are encouraged here to set aside some more funds during periods of fast credit so that um, if things go awry, they are well prepared to deal with the problem. So now, in the fourth standard, it calls for capital for global systemically important banks. Under Basel II, there was none. Under Basel III, it says that systemically important banks, aka too big to fail, <laughs> should have loss absorbing capacity beyond the preceding standards. So now they are still kind of working this out, but this is somewhat controversial because it's uh, a stiffer imposition on these huge banks that we know if they fail, they may drag the entire economy down with them. And so this is what this standard here is designed to accomplish. Of course, some of the banks uh, that are targeted in this provision would include uh, the 800-pound gorillas like uh, Barclays Bank of the UK, Bank of America, Citibank, both are US banks, Deutsche Bank, that's a German bank, Goldman Sachs is another uh, US bank, HSBC, that's actually Hong Kong Shanghai Banking Corporation, JP Morgan Chase and Morgan Stanley, both are also US banks, and RBS, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, there are also big banks out of Spain and France, but these are just examples. So as you can see, by these additional standards, it appears that the news is getting a little tighter. But then again, these are based on the harsh lessons that were learned following the 2008 global financial crisis. Now though, the additional requirements on a Basel III include a minimum of 3% leverage ratio and two required liquidity ratios. These are liquidity coverage ratio and net stable funding ratio. But before I explain these ratios, I think it's important to explain an additional problem that banks often face as a result of the nature of their banking business. This problem is in addition to the problem of loan delinquencies that the capital adequacy standards that we have already reviewed address. This other problem is liquidity. The liquidity problem that banks face stems from the maturity imbalances between the key source of bank funds, which are customer deposits, and the primary investments that banks make with these customer deposits as illustrated here. The, the uh, deposits that come from customers flow through the banks to uh, these investments that this bank is going to make um, in this business. So these investments are the loans to the borrowing customers such as this fine tradesman out here who borrowed only 80 bucks out of the hundred dollar uh, hundred dollars of deposits that uh, the bank has. So you see customer deposits in the form of savings and checking accounts over on this left side are short-term by nature. But loans made to borrowing customers right here on my on the right side are typically long-term. These loans are commercial loans, real estate loans, and even consumer loans. Certainly, they are more long-term than customer deposits. So deposit customers may open account today with a hundred bucks and the bank may lend eighty dollars out of that hundred dollars so that the cash balance left to meet um, future payout obligations of the deposit customers is only twenty bucks as uh, illustrated here so now but what if deposit customers come in tomorrow and ask to withdraw half of their initial deposits of a hundred bucks <laughs> as we see right here this is the liquidity problem because as you can see the bank has only 20 bucks left after lending 80 to this guy over here and so while the bank may have 100 percent performing loans meaning very good loans made to this fine tradesman out here 
and therefore has no fear that any of the 80 bucks lent to this guy would become bad. The bank is, however, in dire straits simply because of this awful liquidity problem created by the maturity mismatch between its assets, which are the loans made to these uh, to the customers on the right side, and the liabilities, which are the deposits from savings and checking account holders right here on the left. So this is the problem addressed in these two financial ratios, both of which are designed to assess the financial strength of uh, the bank. So the first liquidity coverage ratio is designed to ensure that banks have sufficient high quality liquid assets to cover total net cash flows over a 30-day period. So high quality liquid assets would of course include cash in the vault, which is safe and sound, plus any short-term high quality uh, investment securities such as treasury bills these are readily converted to cash and so we want to make sure that the bank has cash and near cash assets that can be used to readily meet any payout obligations the second one net stable funding ratio is designed to ensure that banks maintain sufficient long-term stable sources of funding so that if we go back here, although customer deposits may fluctuate widely, they put in a hundred bucks today, withdraw fifty bucks tomorrow, they may put in some more the day after, and so on and so forth. We want to make sure that regardless of fluctuations, we are able to observe a certain threshold of deposit balance below which we can be rest assured that customers uh, would not um, take out any more. So, for example, if that threshold is $30, then this bank can be rest assured that it has $30 that can be relied upon to make loans to uh, businesses such as this guy right here and not have to worry about whimsical withdrawals by its deposit customers, so to speak. So now, the $30 uh, that is uh, known to be stable plus any equity investments made by the owners of the business and for that matter any other long-term borrowings by the bank itself can therefore be combined to represent the long-term stable sources of funding uh, out of which the bank can then make long-term investments and so I hope you understood all of that more importantly I hope you enjoyed it this is Pat Purdue University Calumet